This interview was made possible in part by a grant from Arts DFW. Hi, we're here at the Modern Art Museum in Fort Worth, speaking with curator of art, Allison Hurst, about the new exhibition, I'll Be Your Mirror, Art at the Digital Screen. Hi, Allison, thanks for joining us. Hi, and thanks for having me. First off, can you just provide us a brief um, kind of overview of the exhibition and what visitors should expect to see? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a pretty large exhibition, group exhibition. Uh, we have 50 multi-generational international artists in the show. Um, the show, as you mentioned, is about the digital screen. It starts in 1969 and goes to the present. There's about 70 works in the show. Um, 1969 begins the chronology as that was the year of the Apollo 11 moon landing, um, which of course 650 million people watched on their television screens, uh, really marking the first time in which the screen became the home's electronic hearth. Uh, 1969 is also the year of ARPANET, which is the prototype to the internet. So this moment in which screens were connecting people in new and exciting ways. So this show, as I mentioned, starts in 1969 and goes to the present. Um, it's divided into nine themes, which we can talk about a little bit more today. Um, and those themes really impose kind of a organization of the exhibition. The show's not laid out chronologically. Um, but by theme, and the themes I chose based on um, where art and the screen really intersect most dynamically. Something that I would like to talk about a little bit is how this show came about, because um, I think it's something that we can all relate to as we can all relate to the topic of screens um, in the show itself. But I started planning the show during the pandemic. That's what really sparked the idea. This was a time in which I was looking at artwork primarily through my computer screen was meeting with artists through my screen on Zoom um, and really thinking about art's role in society in a, in a pandemic and started thinking about artists that naturally were already working with the screen as a tool and a subject. Um, so that's kind of what brought the show about. Uh, but you know, I think these are themes that have already been underway for a long time, of course. You know, as you can see in the show, starting in 1969, but I think for all of us, for all visitors, I think we can connect to it because we all understand how these, these themes that were already underway have really been crystallized in this moment. Since we're actually sitting um, in part of an artwork, can you tell us a little bit about this one here? Yeah, absolutely. So this is an artwork by Lynn Hirschman Leeson. Um, this is in the earliest section of the exhibition. Um, which is called Liminal Space. I just mentioned that it's not installed chronologically, but actually this gallery um, is a little bit of a chronological starter to the show. It spans works from the 60s to the 90s. So really the pioneers in art and technology, including Lynn Hirschman Leeson. So this piece is called Lorna, and as you see, we're in a domestic style living room, uh, replete with chairs, <laughs> um, a goldfish bowl, and a television. So the television is really the access of the access of the artwork. Um, it is it was originally formatted for Laserdisc, and it's a multi-chapter work. Um, it kind of operates as a choose-your-own-adventure, where viewers are encouraged to sit in these chairs and flip through to kind of follow and build this narrative about the main character Lorna. So Lorna is a agoraphobic woman who's based in Texas, and she never leaves her apartment. Her only access to the outside world is through her television and through her telephone. So again, you're, you're here, you're kind of choosing this adventure and going through to learn more about Lorna in the comfort of her own space, but you're still, of course, situated as a voyeur um, rather than a, you know, an equal participant in her life. 
You've already mentioned that the screen is kind of the central connecting factor um, for all the artworks and that there's several sub-themes within the exhibition. So will you elaborate a little bit on the varied types of media that connect to the central theme of the exhibition? Really for media, um, I didn't really put any constraints on that. So as you see and as viewers can expect throughout the exhibition, there's painting, sculpture, there's physical screens included in video. I, there's also video games are referenced a lot. Um, there's an actual video game in the show. There's one available online for viewers to check out too. So media-wise, there really are no parameters. Um, and I kind of you know, chose to do this um, just to really show that artists um, working in all media are using the screen as both a tool and a uh, subject matter in their work. So to kind of follow up on that question, um, like you just mentioned, there's no parameters on the media. So we've seen like 3D printing, digital collaging, and manipulation. Um, and not just the artists that are using like TV screens in their work, like this one that we're looking at here. But how do you see these artists, say, differently from other artists that do standard or digital photography prints or maybe use Illustrator or um, other programs to create graphic works that are meant to be, um, I guess, experienced in a print format? Mm -hmm. I think that's a great question. I mean, of course, pr pretty much every artist today is influenced by the screen and digital technology in some form or fashion, um, whether it's to completely subvert that or to embrace it as part of their process. I think what makes a lot of the works in this show different is that they're really using the screen um, as a subject matter as well. Um, in terms of photography, a good example I would like to use is Penelope Umbrico's Sunsets from Flickr, which is at the top of the stairs at the museum when visitors come visit. Um, it takes 1,200 photographs um, that are user generated to create this kind of tiled collage based on sunsets that were found on the proto, um, I call it the proto Instagram sharing site called Flickr, mm -hmm. um, to really kind of show this typology of amateur photographers to kind of gravitate towards the same subject matter and just really show the sheer amount of images available online. Um, so I think that's an approach to photography and a digital photography and of course um, using found imagery based from the internet um, in a really unique way that really delves into the topic of the screen in a, in a deeper way. So I think that's one of, one of examples that kind of shows that these artists in the show are really using that as a theme too. To kind of back up just a little bit, like one of the first works that we see when we walk into the exhibition is Nam June Paik's TV Buddha. Um, can you talk to us about this work and how this work holds a special place in the exhibition? Absolutely. So that was, you know, there's several entrances in the show. You have the Gretchen Bender also at the top of the stairs, Penelope and Brico at the foot of the stairs. But when you really enter the space, visitors are first greeted with Paik's TV Buddha. Um, this piece was always really important for me to have in the exhibition. Um, TV Buddha is a motif that Paik first uh, approached in 1974 and revisited until his death in 2006. The one that we have in the show is from 1992. Um, but this motif, I always wanted it in the show. I always wanted it as kind of this introduction to the show. Um, of course, it's uh, just to explain, it's an 18th century sculpture of a Buddha that's facing a television. Um, in the television screen is a reflection of the Buddha's face that's being recorded, live streamed on a CCTV camera. So it's really creating this closed loop kind of echo chamber between the physical Buddha and the representation of the Buddha. It's a literal mirror, um, which of course connects to the exhibition's title and this idea of screens as black mirrors, screens reflecting back something about ourselves that we may not see or see so readily. Um, but I thought, you know, of course, I think what's so interesting about this piece in today's context is it also really reflects this kind of um, contemporary social media and the vanity of that too, which has also been very interesting to see visitors interacting with it because there, there are a lot of selfies going on in the screen with the Buddha. You've kind of already touched upon like how 
the decades that this exhibition spans and kind of how it starts. So um, a little bit more on maybe how you were able to narrow that down and select the artist, like because there's such a wealth of um, artworks out there. That's a great question too. So this show, um, you know, was really sparked during the pandemic and I had a lot of time to research and I really wanted to be very thorough with this because this type of work has never been shown in our region, but really in Texas or the Southwest. Um, so I really wanted to leave no stone unturned throughout my process and I had the time to really do so. So I started out with about 400 artists. Um, I, you know, looked, I tried to look at everything that I could imagine. Um, I looked at every show about technology. I was, you know, using artists that I had already been familiar with or visited and just really kind of created this database on the internet um, and just looked and looked and looked and looked. And that's really how the themes started to emerge. I didn't want to constrict anything and put a theme on an artwork and kind of pigeonhole it in that way. So these kind of threads just started appearing and rising to the top naturally. Um, and then I started thinking about the physical space too and that, you know, of course the, vi the viewing experience and the visitor experience is something that I consider a lot when I'm planning a show. And so really kind of marrying all of those elements together is, is how the final list started to emerge. But it was hard, even though there's 50 artists in this show, which is I think the biggest group show the modern's ever done of the most artists, um, starting with 400 feels, you know, it was hard to narrow that down. Kind of touching on that and a little bit about technology, several of the works in the show are interactive. Um, like the work of Christian Lucas and Huntress Janos. And they seem playful, but they also seem quite intense on the software issue. So we're getting a little bit of a span of all kinds of technology over the last half century. But how important is active viewer participation to these types of artworks? I feel like, and this is an interactive artwork too, so there are, there are several in the show. And I felt like that was really important because screens are something um, you know, that we all connect to, we all have experience with. So I wanted to really bring the viewer in as an active participant with several of these works and to really, you know, there's an online platform too to the show. I just wanted to have some different paths forward for people to interact and connect with the work in ways in which they might not be used to dealing with in a museum. This also, like as we're talking about technology, um, this exhibition to me is kind of like an exhibition kind of focusing on like the history of new media art. And so for viewers that are unfamiliar with what new media art is, um, what are some of the artworks in the exhibition that you think visitors should take a closer look at? Well, there's several um, really great, I would say, pioneers of new media in this show, one of which is in this gallery. It's Vuk Kosik, and it's the history of moving images. Um, he, what he did was he took famous films and converted them to ASCII. Um, it's a black screen with the green lettering that people may be familiar with um, from early computer days. But he's a pioneer in net art, um, as well as Corey Archangel, who's represented in two works in the show. Um, Jacoby Satterwhite is probably one of the most important artists today working in that realm too. So there's several, several artists here that represent them. Speaking of that, um, since we're sitting pretty close to um, Corey Archangel's um, Super Mario Clouds um, from 2002, can you tell us a little bit about that artwork? Because a lot of people might be able to connect to it since it uses a Nintendo. Absolutely. So as I mentioned earlier, video games are a subject in several of the works here, including Corey Archangel's Super Mario Clouds. That was another work that was really important for me to have in the show. Uh, it's from 2002. It first premiered on the internet, um, and now it exists in a physical gallery space, which I think also shows kind of the, 
the trajectory and lifespan of a lot of new media art, uh, maybe starting out on the internet and being more accessible to people and then taking on this physical form. But what it is, is it actually does run on a Nintendo NES system, a vintage system that's in the gallery. It's connected to a projector, but it is a modified Super Mario's game cartridge where the artist has removed all of the elements except for the blue sky and the clouds floating by. So viewers that are familiar with that game of a certain generation will still recognize this, um, but it's really this, you know, abstracting of the found game. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Absolutely. Find all of our videos and sign up for our newsletter at artthisweek.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter.